This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. What do you think of the of the new moralities? And they're saying to heck with the uh, the the Christian moralities. And uh, if it feels good, do it. I would say that's really not a particularly new morality. It's a rather old one because people have been doing it for years, only calling it hedonism. Oh, I see. Well, now, now that now that it's being brought out in the light, uh, and more people are taking a look at it, what do you think would be the Lord's reaction to something like this by saying, uh, if it's if you like it and if it feels good, do it? Well, the problem is, first of all, I can think of people whom psychologists call sadists who think that it feels good to hurt other people. And I don't think Jesus would look very highly upon this. It's possible to think of one example after another, the whole idea of treating other human beings as pleasure objects instead of as children of God, I think is a totally unethical one. But the only way the level of conduct and behavior and interpersonal relationships on this planet is going to be changed ultimately is by people seeing each other not as objects to be used as things, but as highly valuable children of God, so that you're not just after your own happiness, you discover this queer spiritual law of the universe that the greatest happiness is giving happiness to somebody else. Well, now, this sort of an, another, another subject, things that have been brought up in, in my uh, social science classes, this idea of trial marriages, uh, would seem to me that the marriage as an institution is one to keep people together and for everybody to just be grooving on the same, you know, frequency. Whether or not they're going to do this for all their lifetimes, you mean? No, I mean as uh, the, the idea of marriage being, uh, you know, uh, forever. I mean, you know, like ideal marriage, you know. And this idea of perhaps having a trial marriage and seeing if you really can get along with this person and, uh, you know, see them in their all, all periods of the, of the day, you know, like in the morning when they first wake up, in the afternoon, you know, when they're kind of, nah, and at night when they're really, you know, really had it. <laughs> You're uh, looking forward with great anticipation of marriage, I can see. Uh, the three periods of the day being, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, you know, it's different states, for lack of better... Uh, different emotional outlooks yeah, and metaphysical yeah. meaning. <laughs> right. Uh, what do you think would be uh, the, the Lord's uh, opinion on this? Essentially, he elevated the family relationship, Jesus did, to the very highest of levels because he based the whole concept of God and man on the family relationship, God being the father and men being brothers. Well, I, I'm, I'm saying this, uh, this uh, marriage uh, would be an alternative, you know, this trial marriage would be an alternative to divorce. I will say what I see as the ultimate solution to divorce. I see it as spiritual growth of individual people. That a great many who are getting married today are getting married simply out of a want of their own happiness instead of trying to bring happiness to the other person. That marriage for many people is a matter of get, of acquisition, of taking, instead of a matter of giving. So I think that it's essentially a spiritual problem, the reason that marriages have been breaking up, and that love is commitment. Love is the willingness to say, I am going to love you for a lifetime, I'm going to love you and desire to do good to you in whatever way I can, bar none, whatever happens, sickness, health, pleasure, pain, whatever, this is my decision. I think that's the nature of high love, and that only spiritual growth can promote that kind of love, which brings about a really great marriage. I, I could dig that. <laughs> what are you doing with that forbidden fruit again? I'm looking for somebody to tempt. I mean, you know, what do you usually do with forbidden fruit? <laughs> Care for a bite? No, thank you. No, I, okay. I've read what happens when, when people do no, things like I mean, just you know, <laughs> smell it, caress it, that's all right. Yeah. Well, uh, what the denomination do you represent? I don't represent any denomination. Good. Good. You say that's good? Yeah, that's good because I don't. I think religion's a personal thing, and as soon as you organize it, you take away from its usefulness, and you also sort of put in an inherent evil in it because you have to have a hierarchy if you organize it. And as soon as you get the hierarchy, you have sort of power plays and things like that. In other words, the riverbed is not the river, the flower pot is not the flower. Right. Um, you just can't organize religion. Like, uh, religion is just a personal thing. Everyone should have their own way of uh, worshiping God, and no one should force any other way upon it. It should be complete freedom of worship. And um, I think in that way, you sort of get a good religion for everyone, because no religion can be perfect for everyone. My central conviction is the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the basic idea of the teachings of Jesus that this planet is a family is 
what I believe if I were to sum it up very quickly. Would you find meaning in that yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, naturally, you have to be children of God and brothers. And, uh, and if you stop fighting long enough, maybe people could see it, you know? But uh, as it looks now, it's going to be kind of a dull scene for a while. I don't think anybody... Dull scene? Can... How do you mean? Well, no one's really going to love until you get rid of all, you know, money and wealth and things like that. Because as long as there's money around, people are going to be evil, I think. Money and wealth in themselves need not be bad things, but they could be used to great good, in fact. In my attempt to love mankind, if I feel as though I will, for some reason, manifest some emotion other than love for an individual, am I not better off to say, avoid being with that individual that I, I profess to hate, say. That's the negative ethic. That would be the following of the Ten Commandments in the same way that a stone or a cauliflower follows something like eight out of the Ten Commandments, since a stone and a cauliflower do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness. In the same way, a person could say, well, I'm very moral, I'm very righteous. He could also be very dead and be following most of those Ten Commandments. The fact that Jesus and the great spiritual teachers call man to an ethic which is not just a negative one and a prohibitive one, but one which is positive in its precepts and injunctions, calling man to love God and love man as man himself is loved. I, I think it's a uh, sort of a, a, a feeling of, of there must be a God up there somewhere and being so confused and, uh, and uh, do, uh, well, do goodish as to be worthless. I see. What would you suggest in its place? Nihilism. Nihilism. That's the only. That's the only honest way of looking at it. That you you are alone in the world, and uh, uh, at least for most of you can reach out and touch other people. Well, I think a person has an option whether he's going to be nihilistic or whether he's going to believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So very clearly, it's a choice which a person makes. As someone was saying to me one time here, you can either believe that you're opening yourself to the benign indifference of the universe. In fact, that's what you said, right? Or you can choose to believe that you're a child of God, that somehow the universe is friendly, that mm -hmm. there's a spiritual realm to be entered and to be practiced. I think it is a choice. Mm -hmm. That it's a dishonest one. A my, dishonest choice? My claim would be no because, because the, um, there is no way you have any evidence that the universe is benign or uh, inimical. It could be, uh, it, it, uh, unless you can <laughs> prove one way or the other, you assume that it's neutral. What if I have experiential proof? That is to say, in terms of my knowing God, in terms of my own prayer life, in terms of what I would only call religious experience, in the same sense that science proves an hypothesis by experiment, religion, I would say, proves its truth by experience. And I would say that by my own personal experience, I know God to be fatherly, I find the universe to be friendly. What would you say? Not motherly, though? How do, how do you mean that? Well, fatherly is opposed to motherly. Well, as opposed to a feminine uh, earth goddess of the <laughs> earlier times where... Talking about Ishtar? Uh, or, or Mithra or some other god, uh -huh. which, uh, which is a, a fertility goddess. Obviously, as soon as we begin talking about God, any sublime experience, we have to use allegorical or metaphorical language. No, I think it does have a point, because, for example, a father is concerned about his child, a good father is, and when Jesus called God by that name, I believe he meant a good father. 152 times in the New Testament he used that name. What about the fatherhood, what about the father of the, uh, of the Jehovah figure who is, who's always getting angry and saying, well, you, you're, you, you're disobeying me. Mm. The but deity of wrath, such as depicted in the Old Testament. Yeah. In the Old Testament, God was primarily depicted as father of the nation of Israel. Yeah. And Jesus did make the one distinction of referring to God specifically as father of the individual. This doesn't mean that the concept of God as father of the individual does not appear in the Old Testament, but rather that this was his emphasis. And on the personal relationship which a person can strike with God, and then which is able to transform his behavior toward others. This is the point. I'm not just leaving it in some sort of limbo and saying one crawls into his closet and has some sort of spiritual ecstasy in knowing God, and that's the end of it. But the other part of it, the brotherhood of man, involves the social responsibility of serving fellow human beings because they too have a spark of the divine within themselves. Oh yeah, everyone does. Everyone, right, I agree with that. Do you think so? Yes. Um, I don't think traditional religion is relevant, especially to young people today. And In a sense, I think that traditional Christianity is dying. What is your opinion on this, sir? 
I would say that institutional, hidebound, authoritarian kind of religion is indeed dying, at least in the consciousness of young people. In fact, this has been statistically demonstrated, and this was in reference specifically to authoritarian, institutional, dogmatic kinds of religion. But I think at the same time, there has been a great increase of interest in personal experiential religion. By this I mean seeking after values, creating a world in which instead of every 20 years going to war, we can begin to live as brothers and members in one family. The fatherhood of God, again, as I say, and the brotherhood of man, the concept of the planet as a family. Does that seem relevant? Well, I, I think that's certainly relevant. That's what young people are looking for, but they're, they feel like they're really disillusioned uh -huh. about traditional or institutional religions just because we don't find spiritual values there at work. We don't see um, bishops being Christian. I mean, we see them more being um, capitalistic. But do you think that these spiritual values are there to be found? I don't think they are to be found in the churches because I think the prophets aren't in the churches anymore. They have, I, mean, I think that young people who, care, or who are committed to spiritual values have to move out and become a family of man like, and become brothers. The function of high religion is to give man the motivation to provide the inward drive by means of which he then is able to go out and treat other human beings in a different way, by means of which he is able to have a transformed attitude toward his fellow man. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God? And to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith. And another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. The mailing address box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y. California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.